Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Book Trib live chat. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Anderson Harp. He's the author of the new military and political thriller, Retribution. Lee Child says that Retribution is tense and authentic. Reading this book is like living a real life mission. Now, Andy served 30 years in the U.S. Marine Corps. He rose through the ranks to become a colonel, uh, and he served as the officer in charge of the crisis action team for the Marine uh, Forces Central Command, and his decorations include the Defense Meritorious Service Medal, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Navy Commendation Medal. Um, and Andy actually came up with the Operation Thriller USO tour for the international thriller writers of which he is a member. Um, and he went on a couple of those tours. I believe he went on two. Um, and uh, today we're giving away copies of Retribution, so after the chat, head on over to booktrib.com to enter to win. And please remember to sign up at Booktrib for the latest news on live chats, giveaways, and original content. Um, and also, uh, you can follow Andy on Twitter at author underscore A Harp, uh, and you can find us at Booktrib. So without further ado, please help me welcome Andy Harp. Thank Thanks you. so much for Thanks coming. For it's Great. Right so before we get rolling with the viewer questions, um, I wanted to know, can you tell us a little bit more about Retribution? It's a, uh, certainly like you say, it's a thrower in the best of Ludlam and Clancy, as uh, some, of the, uh, some of the authors have said. It uh, involves and touches on a, a worldwide conspiracy associated with uh, the uh, something that starts in the in the Himalaya mountains and leads across and around the world with several subplots into London and deep into the United States. Awesome. Now Harper wants to know how have the lessons that you've learned in the military helped you write the book? Uh, well, I, I think it, it sort of. To answer that question sort of gets to the motivation of why why I wrote the book. I was serving at the Pentagon at the time, and uh, a friend of mine gave me a, a, a military thriller. And uh, I was reading the thriller and saying, you know, this thriller takes them down a hallway that does not exist, takes them to a door that does not exist, and uh, didn't have the accuracy uh, that uh, Clancy was so famous for. And uh, I considered it a challenge to, to try to write something that was uh, accurate, but engaging, that you know, moved the plot line and moved the characters, but you could relate to, to reality with the, uh, with the stories and the weapons and the strategy and the conspiracies that exist around the world. Hmm. Very nice. Now, um, the main character in the book is William Parker. Um, yes. Would, and is he based on anyone you know in real life? Uh, he's, a, he's a combination of a little bit of several. I mean, he's a combination of uh, some other Marines. Uh, he's a combination of a survivalist. Uh, he's a runner. Uh, he has been running all of his life. Uh, he was a competitive all-Marine track and field team. Uh, he uh, was force recon. Uh, and also special operator, which uh, are really the two of the households within the Marine Corps family of special operations. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he's a bit of a loner. He is a uh, person that's uh, determined to react to fear and not be fearful. Uh, so um, that's the character that we strive for. So he's, he's a little bit of a grocery list of people that I have known. Is a little bit of you too, because weren't you a survival instructor and you're a marathon runner as well, right? That that is correct. I was a uh, an a instructor at one time, chief instructor at the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center, which is in Bridgeport, California, which hmm. is still used uh, to this day, and it teaches cold weather survival. Uh, it teaches mountain warfare, and it's really instrumental in, in some of the world uh, places that we face, both the Marine Corps and the Army. The storyline also has in it uh, Rangers from the uh, 75th mm -hmm. Ranger Regiment, which is based at Fort Benning, Georgia, which is actually where I'm from. Uh, okay. So, uh, and then as a marathoner, I love to run. 
Uh, you know, I've been running it all, all my career. I went to college on a track scholarship. I was selected for the all Marine track and field team. Uh, I've had a chance to run one marathon. Um, it's interesting. I was hoping to run Boston this year, but in March while out training, uh, there was a piece of um, iron on the ground and it caught my foot and I broke my arm. So, oh no, uh, it is better now, but that, that screwed up my master plan for, for a marathon this year. Maybe next year? I would love to do it next year. <laughs> uh, I've run 10,000, 10, 10 Ks all the time, joy 5 Ks all the time. Uh, so mm -hmm. yes, uh, you know, I love all that, that competition's fun. Yeah, well, we'll be rooting for you I over had here. Fun doing this year. In September, I did the Mo Mokadishu 5K uh, which mm. is a memorial fund um, in support of the Rangers that uh, served in Black Hawk Down. It's more more uh, well known. Very cool. Um, so back to retribution a little bit. The story involves a plot to attack the U.S. Uh, by a successor to Bin Laden, uh, who has dreams of creating a pure Islamic state. In your military career, have you encountered similar types at all? Uh, well, yes. I mean, there, the scenarios are out there. The people are out there. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there are terrorists that would prefer a Muslim state to be in different places in the world. Uh, historically, it's interesting in Afghanistan and parts of Pakistan, there was a there was a pure state, if you want to call it that, uh, over a thousand years ago. Uh, there are states that are always trying to achieve that uh, in the terrorist world. In fact, one of the more interesting stories right now is that with the Malaysian aircraft was that right. the, one of the states that, that this airplane, as the radar reported by Malaysia is right now, when mm -hmm. it turned due west, it was her, heading directly towards the province of Aceh, Aceh province, which is the northernmost province on the uh, island of Sumatra, which is a very dedicated Muslim state and has also been known for having terrorism over the last several decades. What are your thoughts about, you know, the theories surrounding um, the disappearance of the Malaysian aircraft? Well, right now we don't know all the, the, the facts. Uh, we, mm -hmm. we only know and make our judgments on what's reported. Uh, as right. a pilot, one of the things that's reported is so odd is that the transponder went off, but then, as I understand, the plane continued to fly for another hour or so. As a pilot, one of the first things you do, tax your lift off, is you, uh, you put a number into the transponder uh, that is given to you by air traffic control, and then, uh, as might be reported in the media, uh, you squawk the number, which is uh, just dialogue, pilot dialogue, for you activate it, you push a button, and then air traffic control immediately knows what that dot is on their radar is flight number such and such. Mm -hmm. And the, the transponder also reports altitude. And that's why uh, traf air traffic control can separate airplanes is because of the transponder signal. Well, you don't turn off a transponder as a pilot. And if you do, you generally will get a call from air traffic control quickly thereafter. So mm -hmm. that really raises some fascinating scenarios uh, because either that transponder was intentionally turned off, which would mean something happened within the cockpit, or if there is a massive destruction of the aircraft, the transponder certainly would go out, but um, that would not keep flying for another hour and 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. as what is reported in the general media right now is that the transponder went out and then it flew for another hour and plus minutes and it turned west directly towards the Strait of Malacca. And that also is in the direct direction of the state of uh, province of Aceh. So it, it, is a, mm. it is a living mystery going on right now. Definitely. Now you were a pilot. Um, what yes. kind of planes did you fly? Well, I went up through the single engine airplanes, one Cessna 152, 172, 182s. And I also uh, owned a uh, Cessna 401, which is a Cessna twin. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Largely, I would fly as the the off seat in the twin just because of keeping up with the radios and everything along those lines. But I had a twin for, for several years. Oh, very cool. Um, now, we understand that you attended the Iowa Writers Workshop. What was that experience like? That's what really started it all. The Iowa Writers Workshop in Iowa City has a summer writing festival. And when I started doing this, you, you want to get a sense of the judgment of, of your work and get a sense of, you know, where your writing is going. Mm -hmm. And the famous writer, John Gardner, uh, wrote a book on writing. And uh, he was a product of the Iowa Writers Workshop, which has had a multitude of Pulitzer Prize winners. And so I researched that and saw that they have a summer writing festival. And I went out there for about four or five years. And then, uh, and Iowa City is just a charming, charming place. And it is a writer's, reader's haven. And in, in, uh, outside of uh, not too far from Moline, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I took an advanced novel course there with a, a very well-respected award-winning writer by the name of John Dalton. And John said, uh, I've seen your stuff. You, uh, you are, um, you are, if you have the interest, you are ready to go to a um, uh, MFA program. So uh, I applied for and was accepted in a master's in fine arts program uh, where I worked on literary fiction. At the same time, I had the, uh, the draft of retribution um, going oh, okay. on and being accepted by Kensington. Oh, that's exciting. Um, now, Jennifer Assad wants to know, um, when did you know that the title of the book would be Retribution? Um, she, um, Jennifer likes one word titles like this, um, and she wants to know if it came up before or after you wrote the book. Actually, that's a great question. It came up in the midst of the book because the, the actual, the Latin phrase became the name of the operation. So okay. uh, when a military operation occurs, there is a place somewhere, I'm not even sure where, where they actually apply a designator to it, such as Operation uh, Enduring Freedom. And uh, so it seemed to fit the pace in the story of the book. Uh, and it all tied together. There was like, like I'm sure many other writers, there were a multitude of ideas and thoughts, uh, but the retribution just fit everything. She raised another good point too, is uh, I've learned in, in the lessons of writing, you know, uh, a lot of writers would like to write a book and say, a act of retribution. And mm -hmm. uh, just for the economy of, of finding it, people try to Google your book and you say an act and they get, they don't, they don't hear the an or the act, they hear retribution, so they get lost. So a uh, one word title works real well. Oh, excellent. Um, so we have a message over here from Gary. Uh, he says, hey, Andy, fellow 73 AU alum in LA, uh, wanted to congratulate you on the third book in the series. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I know, um, so, I have heard from Gary, I know Gary, yes. Oh, great, connections. <laughs> um, so Andrew wants to know if you're working on a, another book right now. Yes, uh, actually, I uh, have sent a, a proposed outline uh, that's pretty extensive outline. Um, mm -hmm. My agent says it's the most extensive outline he's ever seen in a book <laughs> that is sitting on a desk right now, and we, we're waiting to hear back. Exciting. And it well, is a continuation of the Will Parker uh, character. Uh, oh, excellent. And it goes to another, another ex troubling place in the world. Mm hmm Oh, we're looking forward to it, definitely. Um, Sean says that this book was fast-paced and kept him glued to it. Uh, what's your favorite characteristic about um, William Parker? You know, um, I like his resilience. I like his, uh, his uh, yeah, Patton said, I think it was Patton that said this, but, you know, he said, you know, uh, all the war plans that can be made, all the planning that can be made needs to be thrown out when the first shot is fired. 
And that really, that's really insightful about, uh, you know, about this fiction, but about military operations, about, you know, general type of situations like this, which is you can make plans, but the more important thing is your ability to ra- react to events, react to mm-hmm. the changing turf. And uh, Will Parker has that, that characteristic, that ability to react to, to that which occurs to him right here and now. And that, that's, that's an important characteristic um, for somebody, a character like this in fiction, but also somebody in nonfiction in the real world. Definitely. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences for Operation Thriller, the USO tour? Uh, you know, kind of about what you did, what it was like meeting, uh, you know, service men and women um, who love to read. I've heard that, uh, you know, veterans and um, service people are big readers um, and they love thrillers. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. Well, actually, I've written on this for several news media agencies. Uh, CNN, uh, Larry King Live has has a blog, which they asked me to write. Huffington Post uh, and Newsmax. Uh, the, the story behind it is that I was able to become a member of the uh, ITW. And at the same time, of course, I'm continuing on with a lot of friends and relationships in the military. And I was at the New York Thriller Fest and um, talking to the the great uh, creative fiction and writer, uh, David Morrell, uh, who created this character called John Rambo and said, would you have any interest in meeting the troops? And then I went back to uh, Fort Benning. Uh, A friend of mine was a 75th Ranger who had done three combat tours. James is sort of like one of my my heroes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I asked James, I said, you know, from the other side, would you have any interest in uh, in, um, meeting the guy that created Rambo? And he said, yes. So then I carried that back to the ITW and asked the ITW management, would they be interested in supporting a tour like this? And then I went to the USO and uh, said, what would you think about if we had these authors that would make a trip? Uh, And the USO thought it was a winner too. And it turned out to be a great winner. In 2010, we did the first tour uh, James Rollins, Doug Preston, David Morrell, Steve Barry, uh, and myself, and uh, they don't hold back. What's interesting about the USO is that we went into Kuwait and we went into Iraq, and we covered Iraq from south to the north, and it was still uh, a hazardous area. And uh, we were given the, the privilege of meeting the servicemen and women, women and banking them directly and uh, the kick of the tour was their reaction they were so appreciative of you know just meeting somebody that did this stuff and we were more appreciative of just being able to thank them uh in 2011 uh, a friend of mine andy peterson took a second tour out that went to afghanistan and in 2012 i was invited back and we did a uh, another tour uh, and went into the countries around the Persian Gulf. Excellent. Um, so Andrew has another question here. Uh, he says, why did you choose Chicago as the targeted city in retribution? I think there's some vulnerability with Chicago, frankly, being sitting right on that body of water. I mean, mm-hmm. there is a vulnerability to the accessibility to Chicago. I'm sh- sure we have all the radars possible in the world and sound detection in the world, but still, if you uh, were, once again, in general aviation, if you were in a small airplane and you put it low enough on the, on the deck, as we call it, uh, you, know, mm-hmm. you know, right on top of the lake and you came in, uh, how much time is there to react to that? And you're, you know, you're in the middle of Chicago uh, as, as soon as you, you know, cross over that lake. So I think it goes back to that theme of an accurate, uh, credible storyline for a fiction work. Definitely. Um, in the book, you mentioned that there are some child soldiers uh, used for terrorism um, that are, and they're actually drugged with heroin 
um, to make them complicit. Is that is this some is this based on fact or? It has been reported. Yes, I mean the the uh, the recruitment. For the Mujahideen, the, the recruitment for uh, for terrorist groups uh, certainly makes a play, and they are they are uh, not reluctant about whoever they thought would achieve the purpose of what they hope to achieve. One of the interesting stories about about this that I found out in my research too is, you know, why why are the acts of Al Qaeda sometimes so vivid and so drastic? You know, like mm -hmm. some time ago about actually cutting off somebody's head on videotape and sending it. And uh, one of the military strategists commented on that, you know, most of the media in these countries are not like our media where you can have accessibility and democracy. And they're owned by the state. So uh, a, a, a terrorist group will never get the attention of the media inside a certain country that would ever put a story online. But mm -hmm. if what he does is so drastic, so alarming, so shocking, that it gets the attention of CNN International News, then they're going to play that story, and then that story is going to bounce back uh, through that country's media. So they, there actually is sometimes a very intentional purpose by terrorism as to why they do something so drastic. Hmm. Now, um, somebody wants to know here, um, is the mission bits and pieces of missions that you've participated in while in the Marines? I, I would say it is, a, it is a, it's a combination of facts that I've you know, observed. Uh, it is a combination of uh, real scenarios that potentially exist out there. It is a fic it is a work of fiction. It is, does not try to be a work of nonfiction. Uh, I would not want to write a, a work of non nonfiction because I like the idea of being able to take the characters where you want to take them. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, it's got you know it's got realism built into it. Uh, and certainly, I have been in an operations center. Uh, I have been in the, in, in the Pentagon, and so. Yes, I mean, does it have things that I see? I mean, I try to place my reader in the back of the room, so to speak, uh, looking over our, the shoulder of the action and being able to see what what's going on. So yes, in that regard, it's you it really I really take pride in striving for realism, but as a work of fiction, as you know, the audience knows, to make it work, you sometimes have to make some some leaps of faith. For instance, for example. Right. The hunt for Red October, you have to take a Russian submarine, you have to put a secret mm -hmm. new technology on it, and then you got to talk the crew into mutiny and taking it to the United States. I would say that is a work of fiction, <laughs> but what pulls you along with Clancy's writing is that it, has, it just grabs you with the, the credibility of, of his work that you follow the story. Right, definitely. Crystal wants to know what you think attracts so many readers to the thriller genre. Yeah, that too, that is, that's a great question. I mean, there's probably a little bit of escapism. There's probably a little bit of curiosity. You know, uh, why does Jason Bourne attract so many, so much attention? Because, uh, you know, uh, you get pulled along with the character. Uh, there is for many fans in this area the sense of the accuracy of, of technology and being exposed to some some things that uh, you did not know exist, um, and so there's there's that curiosity associated with military hardware, and once again that's sort of of a challenge uh, for me is how you write a story that reaches out to advanced military technology, but with the writing process and the drafts and everything, how it doesn't get passed in time by the military technology. Uh, you know, there's some things that uh, probably when the first draft was written would be sci-fi far out based in reality, but sci-fi far out. But the, by mm -hmm. the time the book gets published, they say, oh yeah, I saw that in the news last week. Mm -hmm. Best example of that are the UAVs. I think probably 
four years ago, UAV was not as much on the mind of the public as a UAV is now. So the technology mm -hmm. is constantly evolving, but I think that pulls a reader in. And then of course, it all is driven by character. You want to follow along with uh, Will Parker and where Will Parker takes you. And who's one of your favorite thriller characters? Who's your favorite thriller author right now? Uh, well, Ludlum, of course, uh, but Frederick Forsyth is generally uh, on the top of my list for the, day, uh, for, uh, the Jackal, um, because Forsyth did in that book, he, he touches uh, on, a, on a literary style as well as a thriller writer. Uh, mm -hmm. If you read uh, uh, Forsyth's last chapter of The Day of the Jackal, uh, mm -hmm. you change point of views, you change of different characters. At the same time, at the time, it, you know, it was really a, a piece that, that uh, assassinations of world leaders was, was happening. Uh, there were threats on de Gaulle uh, that actually occurred. And then so he took the reality of these threats and these risks. And then, and then he wove this fictional tale uh, that really captured the world when it came out. And of course, in the movie, has been made at least twice. Uh, so, I mean, it still cap captures you, particularly his pace. His pace builds yeah. in the story, you know, from... You know, this is the beginning, the, you know, it just builds and builds and builds uh, until it really reaches a, you know, a climax, like 24 hours. Why, you know, why people enjoy 24 hours so much? Because it grabs a hold of you and just, uh, you're on the roller coaster, you're along for the ride. Uh, yeah, I can't let go. Guys. Yeah, Jack Bauer, um, so I'll put Jack on my list too. Jack Bauer, definitely. <laughs> Uh, Jay Anderson wants to know, have you considered writing a book based on your lifetime experiences uh, with your close friends, Jack Skipper? If so, uh, would it be your first comedy novel? Yeah, uh, that's an inside dig there, and it would be <laughs> comedy. <laughs> it is a relative out there that is, is ultimately humorous, uh, and <laughs> if I could ever capture that, it would probably be a TV situation comedy. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. Some, you know, exclusive dish here on Book Trip Live Chat. Um, so Len Zandro says, hi Andy, congratulations on your new book. Your friends from the NSCIA are proud. Um, which do you enjoy more, writing or lawyering? Best Len Zandro. I think well, I know what I would choose, but... <laughs> yeah. Len, it's good to hear from you. NSCIA is the National Spinal Cord Injury Association. Uh, which is a national uh, uh, organization that I had pleasure of being associated with uh, several years ago. And, uh, and Len does a great job with the NSCIA. Uh, certainly writing is my pleasure, the, without a doubt, especially after fin finishing an MFA right now and uh, being doing on the USO tours. Uh, the USO tours, I can't underst understate the, the, the pleasure it was to uh, the honor that it was to be able to go to these remote places and thank thank these troops. Um, just really a, a cool experience. Oh, great. Do you know, is there any inside knowledge on who's going on the next one? I do not. I do not. I should say there was a 2013 tour uh, that mm -hmm. went out, uh, also generally to the Persian Gulf. Uh, and... Um, um, I'm trying to think, uh, on our 2012 tour, we had Brad Meltzer, who is really is popular with the troops, uh, Mike Conley, who, uh, of course did the Lincoln lawyer, uh, and, uh, has been a prolific thriller writer with great success. Joe Fender, uh, from Boston, Kathy Antrim and myself, uh, 2013, I know, went out, and then I assume they're probably in the process of 2014 now. Well, I can't wait to hear more about that one. Um, Rhonda wants to know what author has influenced you as a writer? Well, boy, that's a good question. Uh, if you asked me this question three years ago, I would have said Frederick Forsyth. Uh, mm -hmm. But also with the MFA, I've been exposed to a lot of literary fiction. Uh, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I did a thesis on Hemingway, uh, in part on Hemingway, um, mm -hmm. about pace and uh, pace and rhythm in a, in a work. 
uh, and Flannery O'Connor, a short, short story writer out of Georgia, uh, uh, and, a, and a host of other writers like that, which sort of taught me the, the depth of uh, character and motivation, the driving force of motivation. Uh, so that, I think that uh, that has redefined my journal work which is to, to strive more towards what motivates both good and bad. One of the, one of the uh, compliments I got on a review was that it, it provides the motivation of Will Parker, but it also provides the motivation of the antagonist. Hmm. Why is it um, these, uh, these people like uh, Terry Ambrose, I think in uh, examiner.com touched on an, on an interview why would you strap 30 pounds of explosive to yourself and and walk into a crowd of people mm -hmm. what motivates that type of uh, person in our world uh what drives them to do what they do so that that continues to be a challenge in my writing as to how to bring out the motivation aspect of, of our world well, you certainly do a fabulous job, and I want to thank you so much for spending time with us today. It's been a pleasure. Um, everyone, the book is Retribution. You can head over to booktrib.com now to enter to win your own copy. Um, and thank you so much, Andy. I do hope we get to talk again soon. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.